Maybe that doesn't sound like good news. It sounds like duration. Hold on. People meet fun. So I'm stuck with people. Stuck with a certain group of people for a long time. That wouldn't sound like good news. And maybe there's some truth to that. But that's not the point. My point isn't that you're stuck for life with people. I'll get to what the point is here in just a little bit. But it's not duration. All right. So we just read John chapter 4. And we're very familiar with the story well, most of us are familiar with the story of the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. What I want us to kind of focus in on as we get started is where Jesus is and when it is that he meets her. So, Jesus learned a fair, uh, when Jesus learned Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus isn't actually baptizing the disciples are, he left Judea. And where is Judea? That's the area of Jerusalem, okay? And we'll, we're going to look at that in just a second. And he departs again for Galilee. That's the northern part of, of his ministry, right? So he's going through there, and it says he had to pass through Samaria. And burn that in your mind for a moment. It says he had to pass through Samaria. So he comes to the town of Samaria called Sychar, and it's in the field where Jacob gives uh, to uh, Joseph, and his well is there. And so Jesus, weary as he was, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. And of course, they're starting their clock from sunrise. So that's about noon. All right? You've got to understand that now. So let's pull up the map here. All right? Here's Judea. Here's Jerusalem. There's Galilee up there. Here's the area of Samaria. In Jesus' day and age, if you were a Jewish person and you were traveling from Judea, and you were going to Galilee, you went across the Jordan River, here's the Jordan, and you traveled north, and then you came back into Galilee. You didn't go through Samaria. The text just said he had to pass. That's not a geographical uh, logistics, you know, like he's UPS, right? It's the holidays, so the UPS, they're going crazy right now, right? You know, they've got to go down a certain route. Whatever. That's not what the statement says at all. Because Jewish people, Jesus' peers, the folks that he was with, they would never pass through Samaria. So to say that he had to pass through there isn't a, he goes as the crow flies. He had a ministry. You know, Luke's gospel tells us that the Spirit is compelling Jesus to go places. Jesus says, I don't do what I want, but I do what the Father wants. So when it says he had to go through there, uh, it wasn't because, well, this is the convenient way to travel, but he had something going on. And I know for most people here, so that's just a, a boring historical fact. I, I don't care how Jewish people traveled in the days of Jesus, but it's central to the story. It has a lot of significance to the story. Because Jesus goes out of his way, <laughs> not literally on his feet, but he goes out of his way to end up Sychar. There's something that God wants him to do. And that is to go through Samaria. Now, if you were a Jewish person in the days of Jesus, you wouldn't go to Samaria. Now, I know there is a kind of a cultural cliche. Like, for example, say that you were to have a son and say that he were to be dating a girl or interested in a girl that you didn't approve of, you might make a joke and call her a name that begins with a J. It ends with Bell. It has an as in the middle. Jezebel, right? You guys have all heard it. You know, we use that term, oh, she's such a Jezebel, bless her heart. She's such a Jezebel. Well, Jezebel is one of the people who makes Samaria famous because she's the one who brings into that territory uh, idolatrous worship. Uh, so it's, it, it's, it's bringing up remembrances of the past. In fact, when the, when the Jewish nation divides after Solomon's death, Judea is down here. Israel is to the north. Their capital is in Samaria. So it brings up 
false worship and Jezebel. In their minds, it brings up the division of the kingdom. It brings up their exile, the shame of their exile, because when the, the first part of the exile happens, when the ten northern tribes are taken out, the Assyrians bring in Gentiles, and they relocate them in Samaria. So the Samaritans are now a mixed nation of people, and good Jewish people would always avoid them. You say, gosh, that seems so boring, but it's central to the story. Because until we get the fact that, you know, it would be kind of like, um, I don't know if this is a perfect analogy, but let's say you had someone who was from the South, and they were uh, very proud of their heritage. And you had someone from the North, and they were very proud of, of their heritage, and you were to bring up something like Gettysburg. You know, I mean, here's, here's this, this, it's that type of, type of area. Eh, maybe not a great analogy, but there's something like that going on there. So Samaria, in the eyes of the Jewish people, it represents everything that's wrong with them. And so Jesus shows up in Samaria at the well and it's noon. And the first thing I want you to notice is Jesus goes to where people are who need him and he doesn't wait for them to come and find him. So the text that he had to pass through here, and so it's obviously there's this meeting that's coming up, and so he goes to this world that's forbidden for everyone with his background, and he goes to where she is, he doesn't wait for her to come for her, and maybe, maybe there's an example for us there. Maybe there's a lesson for those of us who follow Jesus. He goes where she is, and he doesn't wait for her to come and find him. And so what we overlook most often in the story, and I know there's a lot of great theology in this. Those who worship God must worship in what? Spirit and truth. So we could camp out on that for a long time, right? Um, there, there's a lot of great theology. There's a lot, of, a lot of great lessons in here. But what we miss is Jesus is weary, and I like that because that shows he's what? He's fully human, right? Uh, and so he sits beside the well, and it's the sixth hour. It's new. You're saying, so what? Big deal. In her day and age, you didn't go to the well to draw water in. Just like a lot of cultures still around the world who don't have running water. That's hard for us. There's a sink right here. I should turn it on. I can have all the running water I want. A lot of cultures around the world where they go to draw water, uh, they do it early in the morning. But here she is. And it's noon. And I kind of picture her as a little out of step with the rest of the, the village, you know. I mean, she's gone to the well to draw water at noon. Did she do her makeup? Has she done her hair? Did she dress nice? I don't think so. Because she's not planning on meeting anyone there. Because people don't go to the well at noon. They go in the early morning hours. I also kind of picture her as the type of person... When she's in town, if she bumps into someone on the streets, she kind of apologizes just for being there. Kind of apologizes just for existing. Like she's sorry that she's even there. But again, it's doubtful that she expects to interact with anyone. Look at verse 15. The woman says to him, and of course, this is after the I'll give you living water passage. Sir, give me this water so that I'll not be thirsty. Of course, we know that she's thinking physical water. But what we miss is, or have to come here to draw the water. And we think, oh, she's lazy. Sir, give me this living water so that I'm not going to be thirsty again. Or have to come all the way out here to draw this water. It's not about being lazy. Do you know what John is telling us? By telling us that she's getting her water at noon instead of before the heat of the day. And saying, I don't want to have to come here to draw the water. He's telling us she's an outcast. She's alienated from the people she lives right next door to. I know it sounds like a boring historical fact, but she's cut off from life. And people meet for life. Now, here's the point of that, right? Not duration you meet from the time you're born until the time you die. People meet 
to experience life. People don't want to just exist. I don't know anyone who just wants to exist. I'll just, you know, I just need my, you know, food and shelter and the clothes on my back and, you know, uh, that's, that's real living. No, people want to experience life. And we meet together to experience that type of life. And so here, the people gather. They gather at the well. And, and that's where they get together. And that's where they kind of experience life. Um, yeah. They come there for the water because you have to have water for life, for cooking, for staying hydrated, for all those elements. But they gather together because of the interaction. So it's kind of like kids today who meet in the cafeteria. And I promise you, I don't have a picture of a school cafeteria here with this. That would be inappropriate. Um, but it's kind of like kids who meet at the cafeteria. They're not just in there to get that whatever food is, that mystery meat that comes off the assembly line, are they? They get together, and maybe it's not the cafeteria, maybe it's the student union. They're meeting together to what? Talk about what you did on the weekend. So where would you go for Thanksgiving? You know, What would you do for Christmas? You know, What are you going to do for your summer break? How was your summer break? Whatever. Right? They're meeting together. Or have you ever noticed this? You know, parents who are at school picking their kids up, what do they do? Or if it's not, if they're not in the public school, you know, maybe gymnastics or dance or whatever. What, what do they do while they're waiting for their kids to come out? I mean, a lot of them are sitting in their car texting probably. <clears throat> but there's a lot of people who do what? They get out and they do what? And they're talking. And they're exchanging stories. Or did you hear about this? You know, kind of like the woman at the well. You know, she can't gather around where all the gossip is taking place. Why? She's the point she's of the gossip. gossip. Yeah, she's the outcast. Okay, so Howard Schultz. That, this is a, a small coffee shop organization you may have heard of. They're kind of based in Seattle. Is everyone familiar with them? Wes, have you ever heard of them before? I had it. You've had a couple of years. Zach, do you know about these? Yeah, yeah. Howard Schultz says this. We could stop selling coffee and still be business. Good, do you say good luck with that? No, I say it's probably true. Yeah. Well, he talks about a third place. You've got home, you've got work, and everyone needs a third place. And he said the atmosphere and just people being able to come together and hang out. We could stop selling coffee and we'd still be successful as a business. Well, because people meet for life. I bet if you contemplate it long enough, if you think about it long enough, you could probably think of a dozen other places where people gather together, uh, where everyone knows your name and you're experiencing life together. You understand what I'm saying? People gather together for life. But not her. Her social circle is missing. I don't want to come out here. I don't want to have to draw this water. Jesus says to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answers him, what? I don't, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, you're right in saying I have no husband. You've had five husbands. Maybe this is why the women in the, the village don't want to spend time with her. Uh, instead of lock up your, your wives and your kids, it's lock up your husbands, right? Uh, you've had five husbands. <laughs> And now the one, I don't know how the song goes, Zach. I do and now, oh, sorry, my dyslexia. Uh, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you said is true. She's alienated because she's made some bad choices. Now, maybe not all the choices are her fault. She could have had five husbands who all died. Or they could have run away and left her. I don't know. <coughs> but I know this much. She's not at the well when the sun rises. She has to go at noon. She's an outcast. And Jesus shows up. In fact, he shows up for just one person. <coughs> just one person he shows up. Jesus, you know, we're looking at your itinerary. Your travel schedule is pretty busy. You know, to really utilize your time, you probably only need to show up where four or 5,000 people can be fed at a time. 
Jesus shows up for one person, and don't miss this. She's judged by the entire village every single day of her life. And without judging her, this one person he shows up for, he does something amazing. Now, he spends three or four years with his followers, right? In just one conversation, without judging her, by giving her his attention, he turns her, what? To a phenomenal evangelist. After his conversation with her, the woman left her water jar. And I think there's some significance to that. She leaves her water jar. She went away into town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. They already know what she did. They know her life story. The people who rejected and alienated her, she goes back to. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of the town, and they were coming to him. And maybe there's a lesson there for us as well. So he shows up for the one person, and he transforms her into an evangelist. And we think again, people are drawn to life. Now, in this story, and in their culture, the source of life is a water well. And of course, there's a lot of gossiping and conversation and interaction that goes around. And I know we're saying, well, Craig, we don't have to depend on the well anymore. Right? We, we have running water. At least I know in East Tennessee, most of us have running water in our homes, right? There, there may still be some people who draw from the well. But we have to think about whatever draws people together for life. That's going to bring them. The, the sources that encourage the sources that nurture, the sources that inspire, people are going to naturally be drawn to that. You don't have to convince someone if you're hungry, get something to eat. You don't have to convince someone if you're thirsty, you need something to drink. We don't have to convince people you need to be drawn together for life because we naturally are going to come together. We're naturally going to be drawn to other people. And so Jesus shows up and as he shows up, he goes where the people are, and then he says this to his disciples after they come back, right? They're shocked that he's talking with a woman, right? They come back, and he says to them, do you not say there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest, right? You plant the crop, and it comes up four months later, you're able to harvest it. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes. In other words, wake up and look around. And see that the fields are white for the harvest. You know, as the crop is fully blossomed and is ready to be harvested. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life. So that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. Here the saying holds true. One sows and another one reaps. So someone else is planting the good news. Someone else is being able to help that person come to know the Lord. And Jesus says, I sent you to reap. That for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you've entered into their labor. We could talk about that for quite a long time. You know, rarely do we meet someone who has no understanding of God and then all of a sudden we walk them through 12 steps in a 10-week Bible study and they say, oh, I'm ready to become a Christian. It's a process. But Jesus is saying, look around. There are people who are ready you have to open your eyes and recognize that. All right. We've got running water. We don't depend on a well. None of us here typically feel like we're an outcast in society completely. So maybe the story is hard to connect with. Change the circumstances. Change the story up a little bit. At one point in your life, you could probably connect with some of the dots that are in there. But we know what it's like to long for connection. We know what it's like to be thirsty, to be accepted. And I think um, we know what it's like to want relief from the burden of our shame. And isn't that what she wants? Yeah. Go call your husband. Uh -huh. We've had five. When you wouldn't that was your husband. That's why you're here at noon instead of 
6 in the morning. So Jesus goes where his peers won't go. Meets with a person that other people won't meet with. Doesn't judge someone who everyone else has already judged. <coughs> and he gives to her what others have withheld from her. Hmm. And in turn, she wants others to meet Jesus. Pretty amazing. He's the opposite of what his peers do. Accepts the unacceptable. Offers life. And what's her response? She wants to tell others. She wants to tell others. I'm almost done. Let me, let me bore you just a little bit more. She's got three strikes against her. Ethnically, right? She's, she's not Jewish and she's not Gentile. She's a Samaritan. So nobody... Nobody wants to accept the Samaritans. Religiously, you know, she says, hey, our fathers worship here. She points at Mount Gerizim. You guys say to meet in Jerusalem, right? The Samaritans, to this day, there's still people in that region. Do you know that they only accept the first five books of the Bible? Talk about fundamentalists. Talk about legalists. I don't know if I can trust the rest of it. They only accept the first five books of the Bible to this day. And that's the way she was. Well, our fathers say to worship here. You're saying in Jerusalem. So she's she's ethnically, she's got a strike against her, religiously and morally. She would have been considered irredeemable. She would have been considered by her village a lost cause. <clears throat> completely lost cause. And so maybe there's one more lesson for us there. Never to filter people through a, a narrow lens of how we see people who are redeemable or irredeemable. So in the end, the, the end of the story of, of the woman well, and of course, we can't cover every point in it, so I want to encourage you to go and read the story through for yourself later, uh, since it, we just kind of hit the high spots. Perhaps we're just left with one simple truth out of this story. Oh, Craig, there's so many <coughs> truths in this. Yes. But perhaps we're left with one simple truth. The greater our appreciation, now, I'm, I've canned living water, and I'm going to be selling this after services out in the parking lot with the yeah. trunk. I've got cases of living water. I'm just kidding. I don't really. Um, thirsty and joy, new living water, never thirsty again. I guess the end of the story for me is the more that I appreciate the living water, the more that I want to share it with other uh, thirsty travelers who are equally as unworthy as I am.